Good afternoon and good morning to our West River friends. Thank you all so much for joining for um, the second session um, surrounding how to care for roses in the Dakotas. And based on yesterday's attendance, I've learned that we have attendees from North Dakota and Iowa and likely some other states across the Midwest. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Once again, my name is Christine Lang. I'm an SDSU assistant professor and extension specialist in consumer horticulture. I'm based in Brookings, South Dakota, but work statewide with master gardener volunteers, um, vegetable and cut flower farmers and home gardeners across the state. For those of you who were here yesterday, you'll recall, and for those of you who weren't here yesterday as a refresher, we learned about the history, background, and care of roses from our um, special guests from McCrory Gardens, Chris Schalanker and Sidonia Trio, and they really set the stage for the next two days of discussion. Yesterday in the Q&A, I did notice that were some, there were some insect questions, and I asked people to hold on to those questions for today, because today our special guest is Dr. Amanda Bachman, SDSU Extension Urban Entomology Field Specialist. And Amanda brings a wealth of knowledge surrounding insects. She has gorgeous and fun insect photos, and she'll have a lot of follow-up resources for us as well. And I do come to understand that Amanda's going to have a bit of a cautionary tale for us. Is that correct, Amanda? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have made my title for this, A Million Ways to Die in the West. Um. <laughs> So we'll, we'll we'll have a bit of a cautionary tale today too. Um, similar to yesterday, we're gonna we're gonna ask Amanda to present first. And as people think of questions, you are invited to direct those to the Q and A. And at the end of Amanda's formal presentation, she will engage in in Q and A, and we'll have a nice discussion around all of our our burning questions around insects. So Amanda. I'll let you take it away with beetles and aphids and scales. Oh my, AK, a hundred ways to die in the West. <laughs> yes. All right. Let me get my screen shared here. Okay. I think we should be good. Yep. Looks, looks good. And yeah, I will keep an eye and go to the Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, feel free to type, type them in there, but I will, I will get there at the very end of the presentation. And yeah, I am out here in Pierre, South Dakota. I have been with SDSU since 2013. I'm actually originally from Pennsylvania. So some of these critters, especially when we talk about Japanese beetles, are things that I grew up with um, and spent a lot of time with as a kid. So <laughs> then I moved to Pierre and the Japanese beetles weren't out this far west. So that was kind of cool. But one of the things I'm going to go through today are, well, just a lot of the uh, insects that can damage roses. But as we're talking about these, and, you know, if you were with us yesterday, and, you know, learning about the different types of roses and their general care and health, and then obviously tomorrow, uh, we're going to be talking about rose diseases. Um, but with all of that, you know, what are your rose goals? Like what why do you want roses in your landscape? And I've got a picture here from last year's state fair of one of the prize winning roses in the horticulture building. And I love going around and seeing what people have submitted in the horticulture building. And I love looking at other people's roses, but I don't grow them myself. So that's my big caveat is I actually don't grow roses <laughs> for a couple of reasons. One of which is they're not really edible. I do a lot of uh, gardening and, you know, vegetable production, tomatoes. I haven't met a tomato that I didn't love. And so I spend a lot of my outside garden energy on those types of things. But the Mercury Gardens, roses beds, uh, when I've been to the University of Minnesota Arboretum, the roses there are really gorgeous. And so think about what your goals are. Are you going for that prize winning state fair rose or are you just looking to maybe add some flowers to your landscape just for that visual aesthetic appeal? Are you going for some sort of medieval like hedge maze? You know, what are you trying to do with the roses in your landscape? Because that will kind of inform some of your management decisions and some of the tactics that you might want to use if you have some of these insect issues that we're going to talk about today. So here are some of the insect pests that we're going to cover. There are quite a few. And there are also a lot of really great resources online with information on rose insects. Um, I found some really great ones with the University of Minnesota, as far east as University of Maryland. A lot of these critters um, do enjoy some warmer temperatures. Um, 
So we might not have sort of all the problems in all parts of South Dakota all of the time, but they're just things to kind of be aware of, types of damage to be on the lookout for, and maybe we'll give you an idea of, you know, oh, if I see something like chewed on the petals, here's a short list of insects that might have caused that kind of damage. So we're going to start out with the small things first. So our aphids, our um, two-spotted spider mites, our scales, our thrips, things that are small, they're visible to the naked eye, but it might be handy to have some magnification when you're sort of looking for them. Um, and then we're gonna talk about beetles, obviously the Japanese beetle, but there's a couple other ones as well. And then we're gonna talk about some other defoliators and maybe some other things that are impacting the stems of roses. And you can see this is a rose from one of my neighbors walking around in my neighborhood here in Pier a couple sort of falls ago. And again, yeah, I love I love other people's roses. That's kind of my <laughs> kind of my thing. I, I love looking at other people's hard work with growing roses. Uh, so starting out with aphids, and for those of you who may have met me before in the context of master gardener training or some of the other presentations I've done, I really enjoy aphids. They are the plankton of the insect world. They are the base of the food chain for a lot of things out in our yards and gardens. On roses, we have the aptly named rose aphid. Aphids are tend to be very species specific. There are some that are sort of polyphagous and will you know, utilize a couple different you know, species or genera of plants, but a decent number of them are very specific about what species they will spend their life cycle either on or alternating between. I spent a lot of time with soybean aphid in grad school and that one really likes soybeans, but then we'll spend some time on buckthorn um, in the winter. But rose aphids, really like roses. You can see they are, um, you know, that nice teardrop shape. Uh, they're a little bit on the larger size. They give you kind of like some of those pea aphid vibes. Uh, you can have them in like pink or green. And aphids really like the growing points of plants. Like those are the points of the plant that have, you know, like the sweetest sap, they're the tastiest, like they have a great time. Uh, so when you're scouting your plants, you're going to want to look at those growing tips for aphids. That's where you're going to look first. Um, if an infestation is severe, they may sort of move farther down the plant and be on some of the older leaves, but they're going to start out on those uh, tips and shoots and buds. You can see in this image that we've got aphids of sort of all sizes. Aphids are parthenogenic. They will reproduce asexually during the growing season. So this means that Mom aphid is going to have live babies as soon as she is, you know, mature. And then those babies are going to grow up and have more babies. There's no mating stage sort of in between. Um, so they can reproduce quickly, um, you know, which is something to keep in mind when we talk about controlling aphids, because they're going to reproduce a lot faster than the things that are out there that eat them. So we do want to take care that we're not wiping out the natural enemies with our control measures. Aphids uh, and some of the other small insects we're going to talk about do respond to some of the softer touch uh, garden chemicals like your horticultural oils or your insecticidal soaps. Um, so some of those things might be a good choice if you're looking to manage these chemically. Um, but one thing with aphids is as you're scouting around, you might notice a lot of their natural enemies in your garden as well. So I said that they're the plankton of the insect world. A lot of things eat aphids. Ladybugs, um, I've got one of our native ladybug species down here in the bottom corner. I've got a ladybug pupa there in the bottom middle. Uh, lacewings, uh, so those sort of like fluttery green insects, uh, top center there, and then I've got the eggs on the top right. Uh, lacewing eggs will be on a stalk and they'll be sort of like the white egg on the end of the stalk. So if you see those, that's a good indication that you've got uh, some lacewings helping you out. Surfed fly larva are also predators of aphids, and then parasitoid wasps. So if you notice that any of the aphids on your plant are sort of like a brown, like hardened shell, um, those are actually aphids that have been parasitized. So the wasp will lay its egg inside the aphid while the aphid is still alive, like really cool life cycle. Uh, the larva will develop, eat the aphid from the inside, and then sort of use it as its pupil case before the wasp, the new adult wasp emerges. So. There's a lot of things out there that will eat aphids. Uh, these things will also predate on your spider mites, your thrips, your scales, like the other small insects that we're talking about. Um, 
but just keep in mind that you know their reproduction is slower than that of the aphids. So you kind of want to keep an eye on your plants, um, keeping your plants healthy. So dealing with those sort of abiotic stressors will help them to um, be able to withstand some more of the pest feeding, like feeding from aphids. And you might not need to you know bust out the spray bottle for these guys because you've got other things helping you out. And we also have um, an entomology publication, Common Natural Enemies of uh, an identification, well, identification Guide to Common Natural Enemies are Insects, Spiders, and Mites. Um, and this is available at a lot of our regional extension centers. Uh, I've got a whole pile of them here in Pier. I take around to programs with me, um, but if you'd like one, you can you know, drop me an email and we can drop one in the mail to you. But it's a great little flip guide to help you identify all of those things that are in your garden that are gonna be helping you out to eat things like the aphids that might be hanging out on your roses. So two spotted spider mites are another one of our small critters. Uh, these are very small. They are smaller than aphids. Um, you can see them. Usually you'll kind of just see like the movement. Um, if you're, you know, if your eyesight is really good or you've got your readers on, uh, you may be able to make out the two spots um, on the sides of the adults. Um, you can kind of see those here, hence their name. Um, entomologists kind of give things really obvious names sometimes, which can be handy, um, but it also makes it seem like we're making it up on the fly. Um, but yeah, they've got two spots. They're the two spotted spider mite. If you have houseplants, you might have encountered these guys or some of their relatives. Mites have uh, webbing that kind of comes with them. Um, so you, if you notice some like webbing in the, you know, the joints or the crotches of the plant, um, or in folded up leaves, that might be an indicator of spider mites. Um, they'll also cause stippling because they're kind of um, just feeding on that first layer of the leaf uh, tissue. So they're kind of doing some scraping damage um, and that can cause some yellow or white stippling on the plant. So you may notice the leaf damage, but then you're gonna have to take a closer look, maybe with some magnification to actually see what might be causing it. Here in South Dakota, we can end up in drought conditions a lot. Um, and drought conditions do exacerbate two-spotted spider mite damage. And the two-spotted spider mites do do well in those hot, dry conditions. So if it's going to be hot and dry, keeping an eye out for the spider mites is you know, really recommended because those are conditions where they flourish. And their populations can also flare up if the natural enemies are removed or if there aren't any present. So if you don't have any ladybugs anywhere, um, you know, your spider mites and your aphids are really gonna flourish without that predator pressure. Um, so that's another reason why you do wanna kinda balance your management techniques and also make sure that you're sort of putting the right treatment out there um, and not just doing sort of a broad spectrum prophylactic treatment um, because then you're gonna be hurting a lot of the things that are gonna be helping you down the line. Uh, so keeping with the small things trend, uh, we've got scales. Scales are another insect that are pretty host specific, much like aphids, and they are in the same uh, order. So this is another one with a piercing sucking mouth part, only instead of the aphids where they're sort of like free moving and you can see all their legs with scales, they have this like, like the name suggests, like protective like outer shell that they have over them. Um, and so it almost looks like you know, they almost look like they're not alive because they will be, um, during most of their life, sessile or stationary, sort of glued to the twig where they are feeding. Um, these can be tricky to control because if you don't get them during their crawler stage, they're pretty well protected. Um, and that crawler stage is sort of like short when they're young and that's when they're gonna be sort of like moving around looking for a place to feed. And then once they settle down and feed and make that protective dome, you know, they're kind of gonna be impervious to a lot of outside treatments. Um, natural enemies will help with these guys. If you've got a really bad infestation or just notice them on one twig or something, you can scrape them off or just, you know, clip off the twig and destroy it. Um, but yeah, and this is another one too, that if you do uh, kind of have house plants, you may have seen, scales before. Um, I know I've had some friends that have had some tenacious populations of these guys. Um, systemic insecticides can be useful against scales because since they are doing that um, 
piercing feeding of the plant sap. If there's a chemical in that sap, that will kill them. Um, but then you've got that chemical sort of in all of the plant tissues. And then we've got uh, thrips. So this is one that we had last year, sort of early summer, we had the Western flower thrips like showed up en masse in South Dakota. And these guys are small. Uh, you can see the picture here. Uh, one of Christine's uh, grad students, Connor, took this picture for us. Um, and you can see the mechanical pencil for scale and all of the little sort of oblong things there, those are thrips. Um, so they're pretty tiny. Again, you can see them, you can see their movement, um, but they're not very big. And they can show up sort of in large numbers for like a short period of time. And then they kind of go away sort of on their own. Um, they also do the scraping kind of feeding damage. So they'll just be like sort of lifting off that first layer of plant tissue. Um, so you might have some blooms that like don't look great. Uh, which, you know, depending on what aesthetic you're going to, you know, going for, you can just sort of clip those off and discard them. Um, but yeah, the Western flower thrips, and they were pretty tricky to control because they can really get into the leaves and into the petals. So unless you've got really good coverage with like an insecticidal soap, it's going to be difficult to uh, manage them. So like, there's a lot of things that like to feed on roses. Um, and, you know, as far as management techniques, it can be, you got to be sort of really, really precise and diligent um, because there's a lot of places on a rose plant for some of these insects to hide. And for products that rely on contact, rely on contacting the insect to kill it, you want to make sure that you've got good coverage. Uh, some things that are small, but getting a little bit bigger than sort of the aphids and the thrips and the scales. We have the rose midge, which is actually a small fly. Uh, the adult fly itself isn't sort of our main source of damage, but it is the larva or the maggot. Um, and so the flies will lay their eggs um, on the buds or the tips of the rose plant. And then when those eggs hatch, the maggots will feed on those new sort of growing points of the plant. Um, and they can kind of cause these like shriveled um, dead buds if the feeding is extensive enough. And so this is a thing like, you know, when you're seeing the damage uh, really helps, you know, to take pictures. Um, and also for things like, you know, rose midge, it's like, you know, looking at that, you're like, oh, is that, you know, could that be a disease? Is it caused by an insect? And I'm sure that um, Dr. Shires tomorrow will talk about the plant diagnostic clinic, but we do have resources um, at SDSU to help diagnose um, insect and disease problems. So that can be useful too when you're trying to make a diagnosis in your backyard. Sometimes some of these different time, types of damage, it can be difficult to, you know, without a body, without the insect present to be like, okay, what did this? Um, but yeah, a lot of these insects, you can see, really enjoy those growing points of the rose plant um, because they are sort of the tenderest, you know, the tastiest, the sweetest. Um, and yeah, if you are scouting your buds and you see a bunch of little like little cream colored critters, um, those could be your rose midge larva. All right, before I move into the beetles, I'm going to take a quick look at the questions. Um, let's see. Uh, the flip book of insects is Common Natural Enemies, an identification guide to common natural enemies. Um, it's available at the SDSU Extension Regional Centers. And then we also have it at a lot of our events. So um, if you're gonna be at Garden Discovery Festival in McCrory Gardens on May 19th, um, I know we'll have copies there as well. But feel free to email um, Dr. Lang or myself um, and we can figure out a way to get you a copy if you would like one. Uh, why did we see thrips, the Western flower thrips last year? Great question, who knows? Uh, <laughs> Insects can sort of move into South Dakota uh, with weather systems, uh, thrips and aphids especially. Um, and that could have been one reason why they sort of showed up um, and were kind of ready to go and making themselves a problem, especially for folks in Eastern South Dakota. Um, for some of these critters, especially ones that aren't sort of like major crop pests or causing any sort of human disease, um, there's not a whole lot of research dollars to be like tracking their movements and figuring out what they're doing. So 
it's probably going to remain a mystery as to why we had so many Western flower thrips last year. And then let's see, when you have numerous plants in an area, including vegetables, a lot of things that come up is the organic and no insecticides. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, if you have sort of a diverse garden thing happening, I don't control insects. <laughs> is sort of my um i my sort of economic threshold from damage is is really really high um so i am gardening with the intention that i'm building an ecosystem in my backyard and that those predators are going to help keep things in check um you're never going to get to a population of like zero aphids or zero thrips like you would have a population of zero living critters in your yard if you actually were able to achieve that um, so I, yeah, I don't, um, I don't really do a lot of management as we get into some of these larger things, um, like the beetles, the insects that are sort of very visible, mechanical control is really helpful. So getting your, uh, in my case, growing up, my dad would always save, um, peanut butter jars. <laughs> and so he would hand us a peanut butter jar filled with soapy water and send us to the rose bushes and we would pick Japanese beetles off and drop them in the soapy water. And that was our management um, for Japanese beetles in central Pennsylvania in the mid nineties. Um, and so that can be a absolutely valid and useful management technique for some of these defoliators um, that may be active for sort of a short period of time or hard to manage otherwise, or the side effects of the management of the chemical management options or something that you don't want to you, you know, you don't want to risk because you're, you've got bees in the area or something else. Um, so yeah, if you, if you've got sort of a, sort of a diversified vegetable garden in your backyard, um, your best management technique might be sort of encouraging those natural enemy populations and just accepting that you're, um, you're maybe going to lose, lose some kale to some cabbage loopers, but you've got, you know, other predators around that are helping to keep things um, from getting too out of hand. Uh, and then how long is the life cycle of the rose midge? Uh, that's a great question. And I'm actually going to have to cheat and look at Google. So I'll get to that one at the end. <laughs> um, one thing to remember is that insect uh, development is temperature dependent. So the warmer it gets, the faster insects will go through their life cycle, especially for things like aphids. If it gets too, too hot, like over like 95 degrees, that can actually slow down their development because it gets too hot for them and they don't like it. Um, but those nice 75, 80 degree days, those are like peak insect development sort of temperature. Um, but I'll, I'll do some looking here when I'm done on that rose midge question and get back to you. Um, but yeah, our beetles, these are going to be things that are bigger, easier to see. A lot of these pictures are going to be Japanese beetles because they are <laughs> quite the pernicious pest, um, especially in eastern South Dakota. If you're along the I-29 corridor, you guys have Japanese beetles from Seuss, you know, North Sioux City, uh, moving up through Brookings, and I think even into Watertown. Their severity sort of uh, decreases the farther north you get, um, but as, as things are getting warmer, um, sort of, you know, Climate-wise, year to year, uh, Japanese beetles are able to push farther north um, and sometimes a little bit farther west. Overall, uh, beetles are very crunchy on the outside. They have um, the uh, elytra, that first pair of hardened wings. And these guys, yeah, Japanese beetles, if you grow roses, I'd be surprised if you haven't seen these. <laughs> Um, in addition to roses, which are one of their favorite things, they also damage about 200 other species of ornamentals, including uh, trees, shrubs, um, and other flowering plants. And then the larvae actually are the grubs that, um, some of the grub species that cause damage to turf roots. So Japanese beetles love suburbia. We've got, you know, turf grass lawns where the grubs can hang out, eat the roots. And then once the adults emerge, they're just surrounded by all sorts of flowering plants and trees that they like to eat. Um, so if you're in an area that geographically has Japanese beetles, like odds are super good that you're gonna be dealing with these, um, you know, at one point or another, either as grubs or as adults. Um, out here in Pierre, 
you know, crossing my fingers, knocking on wood, we do not have an established population of Japanese beetles yet. Obviously, humans do a good job of changing that. So we'll see what happens in the next, you know, five, 10 years. This is my uh, favorite like glamour shot of a Japanese beetle taken at the University of Minnesota Arboretum back in like 2014, I think is when I visited there. Um, they just they just really love roses, guys. Like <laughs> they think they're the best. Um, these beetles at least have the decency to be distinctive. Uh, they're about half an inch long, maybe a little bit smaller. Uh, sort of oval body shape, and they've got that nice metallic green color on the head and thorax, that second segment, um, and then that brownish bronzy sort of copper color on the elytra covering their abdomen. Um, they have these nice little white tufts of hair going around the side of their abdomen and then on their butts. Um, so the adults, very easy to identify. The grubs are another matter. If you're somebody who's noticing damage to your turf, and you do a little scouting around the edges of the dead patches, you know, pull up the, the turf mat, look at what's happening on the roots, and you see grubs, save the grubs, <laughs> um, collect them, because to identify sort of what species they are, we look at not only sort of the overall size of the grub, sort of depending on time of year, but we also look at the pattern of hairs on the abdomen on the last segment of that grub to figure out, is it a Japanese beetle? Is it a June bug? You know, we have a lot of scarab beetles in the landscape um, that look very similar. Um, and we have to look at the hairs on their butt in order to figure out what species they are. So yes, Japanese beetles, they're shiny and they're just a real, real pain if you're trying to grow a bunch of roses. Um, I feel so bad for, you know, <laughs> Christopher and Sydney up at Macquarie Gardens. Every time I go up there, um, a lot of my Japanese beetle pictures are from their roses. <laughs> um, but you can see sort of the national distribution. So those of you who maybe spent more time on the East Coast or Eastern half of the US, um, I living in Pennsylvania honestly didn't realize that Japanese beetles weren't everywhere. And then I moved out to Pier and I was like, oh, oh heck, like they actually haven't made it this far west. Um, but yeah, they, they move with people, um, especially infested nursery stock can be a really um, nice way for them to move from place to place. So, um, you know, support your local nursery and especially ones that are, you know, that have good sort of plant quarantine practices. Um, yeah, because they the grubs can be sort of in the root stock of like shrubs and trees and then that, you know, those get planted and then you know, the grubs develop, the adult beetles emerge, and you've got Japanese beetles in a new area. Um, in South Dakota, the areas between our population centers, we have a lot of open grassland and cropland, and that's not where Japanese beetles like to live or where they survive very well. So sort of outside of those like suburban oases, Japanese beetles don't do very well. But you can see um, Invasive species monitoring in South Dakota, um, the counties that are green mean that they were scouted and not found. Um, the other colors indicate things, you know, as from established by survey, um, people who think they're going to be eradicated, um, or in the case of Hughes County in the middle, like we've had Japanese beetles found in Hughes County. Um, not every county has been surveying for Japanese beetles, so that's why it's not a complete map, but you can kind of get a sense there, you know, the, the counties that are brown, uh, that it's being eradicated are Pennington County and Brown County, to both of which I say, good luck guys, like, you know, give it your best shot, but Japanese beetle has such a wide host range that eliminating it completely is really probably not feasible. Um, but yeah, so that's that's where Japanese beetle is in South Dakota. Um, it causes a lot of foliar damage to both the uh, flowers and the leaves. And management wise, pick them off and drown them in soapy water. Uh, that's a really solid option. Um, there are Japanese beetle traps available on the market. Um, and these are things that have a pheromone to attract the Japanese beetles. Um, the problem is that those traps are not always lethal. So they'll bring the Japanese beetles in, but if they bring in too many Japanese beetles, kind of like the bag or the trap fills up, and then you've just 
attracted the Japanese beetles, and then they're going to move to whatever is tasty next to the trap. So be really cautious when using those. Um, if you're going to use one, put it far away from your roses, and then also make sure you're checking it frequently. Like this is not a set it and forget it kind of thing, because once it fills up, you're just bringing all the Japanese beetles to your yard. Like it is the milkshake, they are the boys, they're all there. Um, so be really careful with that as a management technique. Take a quick look here. Oh, are there Japanese beetles in Rapid City? Yes, question mark. I haven't been out there to scout for them myself, um, but there was a project a couple years ago that brought in a bunch of like new trees and there was uh, grubs in the soil. Um, and so they kind of got a foothold. <laughs> um, so, so yes, there are probably Japanese beetles in Rapid City. Um, and then many other beetles that have the me metallic green color. Uh, mm -hmm. Not that are the size of the Japanese beetle. Um, so the Japanese beetles are sort of that oval half an inch kind of size. Um, and the brown um, elytra, that metallic brown elytra is really distinctive. Um, some of our, like our, uh, like the dogbane beetle is like super shiny green over the entire body. Um, that That's one off the top of my head that I could think of people confusing it, but the Japanese beetle, I'll go back to, um, the picture here. So the white tufts on the edge are very distinctive. And then that brown, um, brown over the abdomen and sort of the green everywhere else. Um, some of our other green beetles are going to be sort of that green all over. Um, but also when in doubt, you know, take a picture. Uh, insects sometimes cooperate, um, especially if your shadow is behind you. If you lead with your shadow, they'll see that light change and take off. Um, you can also always like capture something and throw it in the fridge for maybe 10 minutes um, and that will slow it down long enough that you can take an in, you know, you can take a nice picture and then it can fly off. Um, if it's something that you're like, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is a pest, feel free to put it in the freezer um, and then take pictures. I'll have my email at the end. Um, you guys are welcome to send me pictures of insects. Um, sometimes when it's just a picture of plant damage, you're like, you know, you really want a body um, because there's a lot of things that can cause, say, like chewing damage to leaves. Um, sometimes the damage itself isn't super distinctive. Um, but yeah, I love getting pictures of things that people are seeing, especially if they are in focus pictures and please don't send me videos. Okay, so moving off of Japanese beetle, uh, Rose Curculio is another one, kind of has a fun name obviously rose likes roses, uh, but this is a type of weevil, which is a type of beetle that has a snout. Weevils, I think are really adorable because of the snout, uh, but there are a lot of uh, weevils that are kind of pest species of different things. So clearly I have a very different relationship with insects than most people. Um, these are sort of on the smaller size for beetles. Uh, they're about a quarter of an inch long and they'll feed on flower buds and stems. Weevils, can also be little butt heads um, because they will feed right underneath the bud and kind of decapitate it. Um, so if you see that kind of feeding damage, that is very distinctive of the rose curculio. Weevils also have a tendency to play dead. So if you are sort of scouting your plants and there's a little beetle that like falls off, um, that's probably a rose, that's probably a weevil. Um, they like to just like fall off and play dead and be like, don't eat me. Um, it also makes it really easy. If you have them, you can just kind of shake your, the flower heads over the container of soapy water and they'll fall right in for you. So great way to sort of hand pick them off of your plants. And they are sort of a reddish color. Um, so a little bit distinctive there color wise, maybe a little bit easier to see against the green foliage unless you are red green colorblind. So some other beetles that we have, um, there are a lot of things that like to eat roses and like to eat leaves. Um, we've got the rose chafer here on the left. Um, you can see the, the window pane damage um, in this picture. That's also very similar to 
uh, that's what the damage um, from Japanese beetles looks like as well. Like these are both scarab beetles, you know, they're, they're closely related. Uh, they're gonna have some of the same, um, you know, feeding and behavior patterns. Um, I have our grapevine borer there, a, a pelodnota in the, in the middle. Um, that's one of our bigger June bugs. They also like to eat leaves. Um, they tend to be only active for a short period of time though. Um, and these big sort of like, you know, bumbly beetles, are really easy to pick off and drown. If you've got chickens in your backyard, you can throw the grubs at them, you can throw the beetles at them. They love having a tasty snack. Um, I also included blister beetles in here. Uh, we do have a couple different species of blister beetle in South Dakota, um, and they will show up in gardens. They more prefer things that are in the legume family, um, but they can be a little bit adventurous depending on what's available. Uh, the blister beetles are kind of the one exception to like the picking things off plants rule. Um, they can excrete a liquid, they sort of like ooze, um, that can be irritating, um, hence the name blister beetle. So you do wanna be careful with those, maybe wear gloves um, if you're managing them that way. But there are, I mean, beetles are one of our most diverse um, orders of insects. So there's more than what's pictured here, um, but there are a lot of beetles that, do like to nibble on things in our gardens. Um, they all have chewing mouth parts. So a lot of times, you know, the damage that you see is that, you know, chewing damage to, to leaves and petals. Take a quick look at the Q&A. Okay, we'll deal with all those at the end. Cool. Pressing onward, saw flies. These are uncanny valley caterpillars. Like if you've seen caterpillars, and you've seen sawflies, you might know what I'm talking about. Um, but if you ever see what you think is a caterpillar and you're like, you know, there's just something not right about this caterpillar, odds are good you're probably looking at a sawfly. Um, you can see in the picture here, it's got this little like darkened head capsule. If you look at it, like the eyes, the eyes are just in a weird place. Um, and, you know, sometimes people don't realize that like hymenopterans, so your bees, wasps, your sawflies have these kind of like, you know, squishy, you know, can have these like caterpillar like larva. Um, I, I think probably a lot of people don't, don't think about like, what does a baby bee look like or a baby wasp? <laughs> but I do. Um, but these guys are also defoliators. And sawflies um, also have the bad habit of they'll hang out in large groups. Like they're, they will sort of like all show up all of a sudden, chow down and then vanish. Um, so you, you might not really have really any time to control them. Um, sort of once, once the defoliation has happened, like any sort of, you know, spraying or whatever is just a revenge treatment at that point. It's not going to do anything to help you in the future. Um, but yeah, so we've got soft flies that are foliar feeders. And then we'll get to a couple um, later on that will actually feed um, inside the stem of your plant. So those are kind of fun. Uh, gall wasps. If you notice that your plant has a weird growth, um, odds are good, it could come from a gall wasp. So these are going to be some tiny little waspies. Uh, there's about 40 species in this one genus. Uh, they really like roses. And what they do is they kind of feed on the rose tissue and then they hijack the plant's uh, genetics to make it grow um, make it grow sort of a house for them, a food source for them. Um, they can look kind of cool in the case of this sort of like rosy uh, gall where it's all like feathery. Um, other times it'll just be sort of like a, a large smooth like growth on the stem or maybe on the leaf. Um, again, they're very host specific. So like if you've got an oak tree or something and you've got galls there, that doesn't mean you're gonna have galls on your roses. Um, but there's really not anything that you can do management wise. You know, if you want, you can prune out the gall and destroy it. But these insects are going to be really small. Um, so you're, it's not something that you're going to, you know, catch with a broad spectrum foliar insecticide. Um, and once the gall has formed, um, the critter is very much protected, you know, inside of it. So um, this is something too that might get mistaken for some sort of disease. And I'm definitely not up on my rose diseases, but I did take plant virology in grad school. And I do know that some viruses can cause some like 
weird plant deformities as well. So this can be one of those insects that it's like, is it an insect? Is it a disease? Like, you know, what's happening? So this is where, you know, samples and pictures uh, can really help us help you um, sort of solve some of these mysteries. Leaf cutting bees. Um, I love bees. Bees are great. A lot of people really like bees. Uh, there, I put them as also defoliators, parentheses, sort of. Um, you can see this image um, is leaf cutter bee damage. It's not a rose. Again, I don't grow roses, um, but it was from like a little like ash seedling that was in my yard. Um, and you can see the leaf cutter bees. They do have a very distinct pattern. So if you have roses that have this sort of like semicircle or almost full circle taken out of the leaves with a very smooth edge, that is a leaf cutter bee. Um, please just consider it a nice sacrifice from your rose plants for the bees. <laughs> there are not chemicals that are labeled to kill bees. <laughs> so please, <laughs> please don't try to treat bees. Um, just consider the fact that if you've got leaf cutter bees in your yard, you must have a really solid habitat. Um, they take those leaf pieces and use them to line their nesting tubes, which is where they like lay their eggs and have them provisioned with pollen. So that's what they're using the leaf tissue for. Um, please, please be cool with them. Uh, and yes, our stem borers. We've got a rose stem girdler and a rose stem sawfly. Uh, you can see the sawfly inside the cane there. Um, and this is one like stem borers, if you notice like one whole like section of your rose bush is like flagging, um, that might be a clue to scout sort of like farther down and see if there's something something happening towards the base of the plant. Like maybe it got chewed on by rabbits. Maybe you've got some sort of like, you know, stem borer that's happening. Um, so this can be a little bit more uh, cryptic damage and harder to find. Um, and then once you, you know, kind of like cut open that cane, you see it at that point, you know, the cane's done for anyway. Um, but just another type of damage to keep your eyes out for. Um, but yeah, with any garden, uh, staying on top of insect pressure uh, can be challenging. Uh, but the way to do this is to scout. Um, as you're out there, you know, watering, weeding, pruning, doing whatever, keep an eye out for what insects are present. Um, they may, again, be delightful, helpful insects like our natural enemies, or they might be some of the things that we were talking about today. Um, but, you know, take pictures, you know, make an iNaturalist account, post stuff there, get identifications, um, just kind of watch what's happening. Um, and also have a damage threshold. Like if you're going for that prize winning, you know, state fair rose, you probably have a very different damage threshold than like me, who's like, I love all the insects, let's see what happens. Um, so that damage threshold will help you sort of inform um, how much you're gonna treat, uh, how frequently, what kind of management options you're gonna use, um, and then whatever you, you do for management, maybe it's choosing a, you know, hardier rose variety or changing a planting time or using netting or something, um, record the results of what you do. A lot of times people will just like spray and then they're like, man, this didn't work. And it's like, okay, what did you spray? Like, what was the product? Like, what did the label say as far as like treatment conditions, uh, reapplication interval? Uh, scouting afterwards to see how effective it was. Um, all those things are really important. So record the results of your treatment because that will help you make better decisions uh, than during that same growing season or then for subsequent growing seasons. And then this process just gets reiterated, you know, the whole way through the growing season. Um, this is my sneaky way of teaching you all integrated pest management. It looks like we'll have some time for questions. Um, as far as submitting samples go, um, I put the SDSU Plant Diagnostic Clinic is there. I know Dr. Shires will have more information on that tomorrow because she runs it. Um, I'm out here at the Peer Regional Center. So if you're local to Peer, you are welcome to stop by with a critter. I really enjoy it when those are already dead. Please freeze them before you show up. <laughs> it makes it much easier for me to handle them under a microscope. Um, and you can also mail insects to me um, at that address. Uh, put them in a hard-sided container. If they're just in an envelope, they will get squished going through mail processing facilities, and then it makes it difficult for me to identify them. Um, or shoot me an email with a close-up in focus picture. And I will put my contact information there while I take a quick look at the Q&A. 
Okay. Let's see. Okay, so I'll I'll do the milkweed beetle uh, <laughs> one real quick. Um, milkweed beetles are kind of destructive. Um, they do feed on the milkweed plant, and they will also feed the larva. Um, will feed on the roots of the milkweed plant. Um, I don't. I don't encourage chemical management on milkweeds for a lot of reasons, um, because there are, you know, obviously the monarchs. Um, but there's a lot of insects that use milkweed as part of its life cycle. Um, if you notice that you're, if you've got the milkweed bugs and they're kind of, you know, going crazy on it and looks like it's really stunting your plants, they're absolutely one that you just use the soapy water um, defense on. I've, I've picked milkweed bugs off um, to either drown them or I just put them in a container and then freeze them. Uh, and then I use them to teach 4-H kids how to pin insects. Um, so, uh, but like, yeah, milkweed, I really don't recommend any sort of chemical management on it. Um, there's just too many non-target impacts and you're gonna do more harm to, you know, monarchs and other things that need it for their life cycle. Um, and plus the milkweed bugs are part of the ecosystem. They're supposed to be there. You know, if you've got too many milkweed bugs, like plant more milkweed. <laughs> All right. I am going to stop sharing. Okay, uh, thoughts on roses, classes, annuals. Um, Christine. Yeah. <laughs> you can have <Hi>. that one. <laughs> so Steve, thanks for that question um, about, you know, hearing some feedback from garden centers in South Dakota calling hybrid teas annuals versus perennials. That's really gonna depend on where you are in the state. Um, I feel like growing up in West Central Minnesota, we too were trying to plant hybrid tea roses. And I wonder if there was some historical optimism on the hardiness zone of that, because I look back now and go like, that was nuts and not a good idea. Um, it, it did not work well. Most of our hybrid tea roses are really only hardy until to about zone five, which with updated USDA hardiness zone maps and um, less really, really cold winter temperatures, um, you know, extreme lows in the winter, I think we're going to maybe see where we can grow hybrid teas creeping up a little bit in South Dakota. But it's important to remember that there's going to be more management, like you alluded to, for managing diseases like black spot and, you know, some of the other diseases that Dr. Shires will be talking about tomorrow. So that is my hunch as to why garden centers are trying to steer people away from it. Um, I know folks sometimes do get frustrated if they see a really beautiful rose, they purchase it, they plant in their yard, and they don't realize that it's a hybrid, and then it dies out. So um, I'm guessing our, our the garden centers are trying to protect the average gardener or the person who really wants a rose that they can set it and forget it. So if you're looking to purchase hybrid teas, pay really close attention to the hardiness zones and realize that you might have to do, you know, mulch beds or, you know, the crazy styrofoam cones or some other things to overwinter them. So I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying there are some more low input options. And that's where I would steer people back to looking at the All-American or uh, the American <laughs> Rose Trials for Sustainability, looking at the arts website and looking at their list of regional winners for roses. Oh, back to you, Amanda. <laughs> this is great. I got to look up the, the rose midge. Uh, so good news with the rose midge is that it is a fairly uncommon pest. It's not one that we see very frequently. Um, it does have a pretty short life cycle, kind of almost like fruit fly-esque. Um, the adults only live for about two days, and those maggots are active for about a week. Um, so they can they can go through the whole like adult to adult life cycle in about 20 days if the temperature is right. But it's not a very common pest, even in areas out east. They're like, this is really uncommon. So I wouldn't worry too much about it here in South Dakota. Uh, let's see. Their three in one product that fertilizes and is supposed to kill insects work on all those rose predators. Uh, OK, I'm not really a big fan of the three in one products for a couple different reasons, um, because the odds that you have all of those exact problems at the exact same time are really low. Um, you know, it just, mm, I don't like them. Um, <laughs> especially because they're usually a broader spectrum insecticide. And if you're 
doing a fertilizer schedule, you just end up sort of prophylactically or preventatively applying an insecticide when you don't need it. So I would really recommend taking the time to split out your chemicals as far as your fertilizers, your things for insect management, your things for disease management, and don't don't take the shortcut of the three-in-one product. Um, so that's my spiel on that. <laughs> also, always read and follow the label directions. Um, that is super important because uh, even if you can get it at a hardware store, you probably still need to wear gloves. So make sure you got your PPE. Um, natural predators for sawflies or blister beetles. Birds! <laughs> Birds eat a lot of insects. Um, so when we going back to that question about, you know, like how do you sort of manage a diverse ecosystem, encouraging some of the vertebrates uh, will also help. Um, so, you know, feeding the birds um, and then like keeping them around and then it's like, oh, insects here, have a snack. Um, that's another great way to kind of keep balance in that ecosystem. So yeah, uh, birds are gonna eat both of those. Um, and then there's also like, there's always a bigger insect out there like praying mantids, um, you know, they'll chow down on some of these you know, there's there's a lot of stuff out there that can be a predator um, that might be sort of more generalist. And I will say, uh, don't order insects to release. Don't order a mantis egg case. Don't order a bunch of lady beetles. Encourage the habitat because that will bring in the ones that are already in your ecosystem. When you order those kinds of predators, Sure, you can release them, but they're going to go everywhere. They're not just going to stay on your property. And you also don't know if they were ethically sort of harvested um, or raised in a sustainable manner. And you don't always know where they're coming from. So you could be introducing uh, diseases into your local insect population. So we encourage sort of local habitat creation, not importing uh, predators from other areas. Um, cicadas, your roses will be fine. Um, also, South Dakota, we don't have any of the periodical uh, fun cicada populations. We have an annual cicada that we have cicadas every year. Um, don't worry about it. Your roses will be totally fine. They like trees. <laughs> we don't have those. <laughs> we'll just enjoy listening to them when we stop to smell the roses. That's what we'll do. <laughs> yep. I, I'm absolutely going to be taking a road trip when the cicada emergence is happening. Go over to like Iowa, Illinois, somewhere to see the to see the 17 and 13 year cicadas. It's very cool, highly recommend it. <laughs> well, as our time together is drawing to a close, if you have more insect questions for Dr. Amanda Bachman, this is a great time to ask those live. Um, for people who potentially joined us late or are excited to share this recording with a friend um, or just watch it again because you loved it so much and you wanna go back and look at the photos, um, all of the session recordings will be available on the SDSU Extension YouTube channel after the fact, but do give our team a few days to get those posted. And like many Extension events, we do love and value your feedback. So I have put a link to a short survey in the chat. If you would take a moment to open that on your phone, your tablet, or your computer before you go today and fill that out, we'd certainly appreciate it. Um, and it looks like we've had another question. So I'm going to pitch it back to you, Amanda. I know I'm like doing my looking, <laughs> looking at the softlies. Okay. So, uh, the softlight infestation, uh, well, I'm curious as to what plant it was on because softlies can be a little bit specific. Um, and I know, uh, John Ball in the tree pest alert, there are softlies that will sort of like you know, hit some young trees and that kind of thing, and then kind of like move on their way. Um, so that would be, I would be curious as to what it was on. Oh, it was all of your heirloom roses. Okay, so topical. <laughs> um, you're going to want to do a lot of scouting. Um, you know, keep, you know, especially checking like undersides of leaves um, so that when you, because you will, you will see them. Um, but yeah, if you're just not if you've never sort of looked for them before in a season, they can just kind of like appear out of nowhere because they are sort of like very similar green to the leaf. So you got to look real careful. Um, but I would say scout um, and, you know, do your research on your treatment methods and see what you want to do about them so that you've got that on hand so that when you do see them, you're ready to go um, with your treatment option. All right. Well, Amanda, um, as we're drawing to a close, maybe a question to pitch to you. Um, how are all of, and maybe take a minute to think about it because I'll have some other things, but 
how is um what are we calling this false spring and then March going out like a lion and the lack of <laughs> snow cover you know I if you can take a minute to look into your crystal ball how is this potentially going to influence um pest populations in 2024 if you could look ahead <laughs> yeah it's I mean and that's you know some of my colleagues in other states have been writing about this as well and I've I've absolutely been reading like the Iowa like Hort newsletter and Minnesota and too and sort of reading around the region and yeah so you know, we're, we're not going to be having that like winter dieback that we get with some pest populations. I think things are going to have had pretty good overwintering success because we just, you know, we didn't get cold enough for long enough to have like severe mortality on something like Japanese beetle grubs. Um, and I think with the fluctuating temperatures, I think some things might be emerging earlier than we're sort of used to seeing them. So definitely kind of keep an eye out for critters. Um, and, you know, in Pierre, it was like 65 degrees yesterday and it's like 20 today. Mm -hmm. um, the thing with insects, though, is that they can survive some sort of amount of cold temperatures. They'll go and like hide in leaf litter or like find a, you know, find a place to shelter. So just because it's getting cold again doesn't mean that they're all going to drop dead. Um, I think things that have emerged are, you know, I've, I mean, I've seen like flies, you know, flying around. So like those things are going to be, you know, starting their life cycle. I've noticed that weeds have been emerging. So there's, you know, there's plant life for them. Uh, they're definitely going to hunker down during the snowstorm, but they'll be like right back at it when it melts and warms up again in early April. Yeah. And I want to add from a plant perspective that, you know, in a year like this one where we've had a lot of periods with limited snow cover, that can be a little gnarly for some of our perennial plants. Again, the the overwintering structures are are typically below the soil. Our herbaceous perennials are going to be growing back from, from crowns that are below the soil. So they do have some protection. Um, but we might notice some winter dieback this year. I will say with roses, um, you know, as an evaluator for the trials at McCrory Gardens, there's times where I'll go through and I'm like, I think this rose is dead and I'll come back a few weeks later in June. I'm like, oh no, there's actually green growth. It's maybe, it's maybe not super alive, but it held on. So, you know, maybe a little bit of patience as we think about general rose and plant care to see what emerges and realizing that we might see some, okay, this one lived, this one didn't, <laughs> and some weird microclimate effects this year as well. Um, so just wanted to highlight that. Uh, Amanda referenced Dr. John Ball's tree pest alert. We have two newsletters for SDSU Extension related to all things plants and gardening. Um, and if you sign up for the SDSU Extension Garden and Yard newsletter, you'll get cross links to Dr. John Ball's um, tree pest alert as well. And so you can get all of the information in one spot and also get updates on events such as this one, things like garden hour. Um, we're going to have our next garden hour on Tuesday, April 2nd, and we'll be probably digging ourselves out from the snow and looking ahead <laughs> to to the season. We'll have Sydney Trio joining us for that garden hour. I'll be hosting and we'll have Laura Edwards giving us a climate forecast. So we'll have a, a sense of what's going to happen for spring. Um, so I would just invite everyone to return tomorrow and join us for the rounding out the rose discussion with a discussion of all things diseases. And Amanda, I just want to thank you so much. I always love the photos, love the information, <laughs> and I learned several new things and always appreciate the fun jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad somebody does. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, a final shameless plug for you to fill out our short evaluation. And again, this will be posted after the fact on the Extension YouTube channel. And keep an eye out for Amanda Bachman in person at events across the state many appearances on Garden Hour and articles in our newsletter. Thank you so much, Amanda. And thank you so much to all of our guests today. Have an excellent afternoon.